Hi, everyone. My name is Christy Reese, and I am going to um, share a presentation that we create for families. And as I was sharing, if some of you heard earlier, when we're sharing with educators, we'd like you to see what we're giving families, the information we're giving families. So you are aware, and then you can also share it as a resource. So I will just share. So Christy Reese, and I'm the executive director at Fact Oregon. And the young man you're seeing right there, his name is Dennis. And he is who brought me to this work. He's now 20 years old, so I feel a little old. Um, he just turned 20 in March. And it was having Dennis that brought me into the world of disability and figuring out what accessibility meant for him. And so he drives a lot of the work I do still today. Um, because he was a complex learner and we had to figure out the ways that he would learn the best. And I'm not sure if you can see that the middle little picture, he was actually on an iPod touch. So, I mean, we're a little dated, but you can see like he was using technology um, way back then. And you'll hear how that was important in our family in just a little bit. So, I'll just quickly, FAP Oregon, we're a statewide nonprofit and we work with youth and families. We want to transform how people uh, perceive disability. We want families to pursue whole lives in whatever way that works for them. And we're the state and federal parent training information center. So we support families all over uh, around special education issues and we do other disability issues, but we have the designation as a PTI. And we serve community. We serve families and youth with disabilities um, and partners. And we like to do presentations like this to bring family voice, youth voice um, to the table. And so the way I structure today was some of this you're going to say, well, we already know. But is the what and why of AIM and accessible materials because families don't always know the what and why. They don't know even the acronym, like what does that mean? Um, they don't understand that there are laws that connect AIM, who can get it, and what's getting in the way, which is a, an area we'll focus on, because there are some barriers that don't need to be there that do create that barrier, and then just talk about possibilities. So I'm going to start with the what and why. And also, oh, you know what? I'm gonna stop sharing for just one minute. And I forgot I had a Mentimeter in here. So I'm gonna share, I'm gonna ask you, how many of you have used a Mentimeter before? Reactions, okay. I forgot to pull that up when I started. So I'm gonna get that to come up. And now I'm going to share again. Okay, so here is the Mentimeter. If you all would like to join. And I'll give you all a moment if you'd like to. And we share this with the families and kids we support. You know, we have a small enough group. You can come off of mute. You can put something in the chat. We just want to give a, an opportunity for folks to be able to connect and um, understand what we're talking about. So before, I'm thinking I know which one you all should say. How do you all feel about your understanding of AIM? Pretty good. So let me ask you a different question. And you, some of you have answered already. How do you think the understanding families have of AIM is? Would you change your answer? I 
Okay, so I'm going to just leave that there. And as we keep going, ask you to consider, do families know? Do they have an understanding? And what would they need to know? Lost my screen. Okay. Now I will get back the presentation. Okay. So you all know what the materials are. Accessible. You know what? I've lost my screen to see you. Well, there you are. I like to see faces. Oh, someone said they would change. That's okay, Joy. We can we can talk about it. Um, thank you for all of those chats. So you would change. And I think that's important to know is how we can educate families. So what I work to do is make it simple. Because Debbie Wright, in education, there's these high level words, these um, acronyms. We throw them around, assuming that families know what we're talking about. And in essence, they haven't been introduced to it. And honestly, in the lives of a family member, there's a lot going on. So staying on top of some of that is harder. What I'm looking at is how is my kid making progress to their goals? Are they doing well? I'm not always thinking that that's going to happen. Right. Thank you, Chandra. That's right. I mean, you don't know the whole acronym. I knew about technology. Um, I knew that I always worked to try and make things accessible, but I can tell you that's not the word I would use. Um, I would... I get lost in IEP meetings with my caseloads because teachers just fly with them. Yeah, it's just, there's a lot happening. So, you know, it's really about giving access to how a kid learns in formats that they can use. And I think sometimes that, especially educators, you do this well, even just doing it as you're going, but because we call it formal and when we're working with kids with disabilities, we think it's extra and you all know what it is, but it's really letting families know it's how we can utilize a child's strength and what they can do so they can access information. And you all know the formats and for Devin who says parents don't always know what their kids cannot access. That's right. And that's part of a conversation and it helps educators know if something's happening and a child is not able to access information, it helps you think, hmm, what works for them? What do I know about this student? And what might be something? And sometimes if you talk to a family who has a really good understanding, they know their kid the best, they will give insights and ideas that might spark ideas for you on what to do to make things accessible. So you all know what it is, what the formats are. I think one of the things that in working with the AIM cohort with Deb and the rest of the state team is, is really looking at how we don't, um, I know there are certain parameters and certain disabilities, but how if we think about accessibility for all students and we don't just focus on those we think can access materials, I think it opens up a whole world when we ask again, how can we make it accessible rather than focus on a disability? And you've all seen this from AIM, from the cast, uh, what is accessibility? It's making sure that people with disabilities are getting the same information in a similar way with the same services as those who don't have a disability. And often, well, and we're going to talk a little bit later about what gets in the way, but it's really that basic is how can we get it? How can we, we make those shifts just so someone can access the same material? 
And I, I enjoyed this. Deb sent me some uh, materials and I really liked the contrary to common assumption, digital does not mean accessible. So I have a story and this is the joystick and the mouse. And as I shared earlier, I have a 20 year old son. So if all of you with technology think back 20 years or 15 years, it's changed a lot. So when our son was little and he was in school, he did not connect a mouse using a mouse and the arrow on a screen. He didn't have that connection yet. But he was born at a time where the iPhone and the iTouch had come out and they were in those early phases of the Apple products and his aunt had an iPhone. And he learned very quickly how to navigate the phone. He knew what to touch to get to the pictures, to play a game. It's part of why we got him a touch because we would put different apps first, then app we used quite often when he was young. So he had the touch screen. So when he started school and the kids can use a computer and back then, you know, they were the big backed computers. Um, he couldn't figure out the mouse. It just didn't connect. And we did all the things. We taped a big red arrow on the mouse and we made the arrow on the screen really big. Didn't work. But what worked was touching the screen. So being the mom I am, I did some research and I happened to go to OTAP's lending library. And this, again, it dating a little bit. There were these things these overlays for this screen, Deb's month, that you were able to attach to the front of like the big computer screen, the monitor, and you could plug something in and you could make it a touchable screen. And in my own research, they weren't really expensive and OTEP had them in the lending library. And so I came to the team and I said, Dennis is not, connecting mouse and screen, but touch screen he can do. And there are these things that you can get to make your existing computers, the existing monitors, a touch screen. And then he would be able to more independently navigate the books and the stories. And they said, huh, I'll have to go look and see what we have. And they came back and they said, um, we don't have those, but I have a joystick. And I said, great. And it's not a matter of him using the mouse. He understands the clicking. He's not equating yet what his hand is doing here and the mouse is doing there. And they said, well, tell me more. He can navigate a touch screen using his aunt's iPhone. He can get to where he wants to go. And I believe as long as he has his touch screen, he will independently access the monitor. And we had to go back and forth a bit. And they ended up, and if you remember 15, 17 years ago, a, a laptop with a touch monitor was extremely expensive. We made some accommodations and we worked. And even though it was still digital, I just wanna draw that what you have in the library is not necessarily what a kid needs. They put the touch screen on and guess what? Dennis no longer needed extra help to navigate. He was able to independently go to read the books. Um, I forget, you know, the library that they have, read the audio books, touch around and move without additional support. And eventually he learned how to use the trackpad and a mouse. He just needed that bridge and he just needed a touch screen. But instead what happened is we looked at, well, what do we have? We didn't look at what his needs were. We just said, well, this is the technology we have and we're going to use it. So remembering it's about looking at the child, looking at the student and then see what they need to access, whether it's technology or, you know, something else. It's about what they need and not defaulting 
to, to what we have in a closet. So, and this I think is just, for me, it's key. It's the difference between learning barriers and opportunities. Every time we were able to find out how to make something accessible for him, he was able to learn. Our son spent his time in a general education classroom. And so creating materials that were accessible in a way he could access that it for him included modifications, he was able to learn and often more than what folks thought he would learn. And so you're just, re it's removing a barrier to create an opportunity. So what do you think? I'm gonna, so test now for these educators here. What laws impact AIM and accessible materials? If you wanna type in the chat what you think. And think about this for families. If you were to ask families, would they know that there are some requirements and laws that include accessibility? IDEA? Mm -hmm. The biggie. And not just meeting a student's unique needs. Anyone else? I assume there were laws, but didn't know what they were yet. AIM Act. Oregon has OARs that mandate AIM for FAPE. Section 504, accessibility. Remember, Remember that we have an educational pyramid and students who receive special education services, they're at the top of the pyramid. But students with disabilities, you know, there's all students. They're all entitled to receive education. And then we start moving up. In Section 504, you know, there's ADA. Then we have Section 504. And then when we get to IDEA at the top, those students are still covered by all of the education laws. And so section 504 is about equal chance to participate. It's about making things accessible. So it's at school in community, it's the same opportunities as everyone else. And sometimes we forget that students receiving special education services still also receive the accommodations and are covered under Section 504 and ADA. The letter from OCR, this is old, but I think it's really important because it says emerging technology. Now, when you think back to 2010 and how much has changed, think about another 10 years. So I think it still stands because if it's inaccessible to a population of students with disabilities, it's discriminatory. We need to be able to have benefit in an effective and equal manner. And I thank Deb for this because I got that from you. But I think that's really powerful. It's ADA, it's Section 504, and we've not even gotten to IDEA. And then, of course, we do have IDEA. Now, I'm going to pause for a moment and ask you to consider the purpose we have, the whole reason we have special education. And this is something that we share with families so frequently because they don't realize there is purpose. It's not just um, going year to year. It's for FAPE, but it's for students' unique needs to prepare them for life after school. It's for their further education, employment, and independent living. So even when they're little, the whole goal is we're preparing students with disabilities for life after school. And sometimes that's a big aha moment when you hear it because you realize it's bigger than maybe what's the immediate goal. And yes, we work our way back to the age of the child 
But we ask families to take a lens and I ask all of you, is what you're doing going to prepare a student for the future? Are you going to prepare them? Is it working toward the ultimate goal the family has for life after school for their student? And it is covered in IDEA. Instructional materials, the timely manner. I think Joy re added receiving the same info in a timely manner as peers. Same time, absolutely. School districts need to be able to do that. Assistive technology is built into IDEA, which can create mechanisms for accessible materials, no matter what they are, but it's to increase and improve functional capabilities. Now, okay, educators, I'm gonna see which ones know this. So we're use, we use the standard IEP um, when we're sharing. So this is the Oregon standard IEP. And it's a picture of special factors. And we share with families, these are the special factors. And of course, you all know F and G toward the bottom. And how many of you know or remember that if you're using a program, and I think the state has seven, eight, nine different IEP versions, um, the one I'm most familiar with is Synergy. I see that the most, and you all know, I'm assuming Synergy does not include G at all. It's just not there. Now, I've heard from folks that some districts maybe make a stamp or they make a, a note somewhere, but I also know that we have a shortage of all of you educators, that you're pulled in many directions. And one of our board members is a professor at o, um, U of O teaching uh, special education and said, school districts, they're going um, to students now and they are really trying to recruit. So we have a lot of new educators who may not always know that the program they're using doesn't have this. And so, and right, Deb, it doesn't relieve the school district and yet, if the team's not familiar and a family's not familiar and they don't know that this is a possibility, how do we complete and answer this question? And so it's on it's a responsibility of educators and as the PTI that we are informing families of what they should be looking for and addressing within the team because it is it does need to be included. So I think you all know who can get AIM. And those are students with disabilities that affect um, their access to standard materials. Now, I also know that there are certain um, uh, programs, I'm thinking of Bookshare off the top of my head, that have some more restrictions on exactly who, where they really call out specific students um, that's been one of my passions to address for years, and I've never gotten the time yet to deal with, um, to look at the Chafee Act and things like that, to open it up. But there are more options these days. And so uh, I think one of the best things I've ever heard is if a student is not getting print, then we need to look at how we make something accessible to them. And I think that's really important is that we don't get caught in a specific eligibility, but we just look at how we make it eligible, or I'm sorry, accessible. So what's getting in the way? So I'm gonna share from a family perspective what we see time and time and time again as getting in the way for access to ableism. And if, has everyone heard of the term ableism? I'm hoping. The discrimination against people with disabilities, thinking that people with disabilities are less um, important and typical abilities are superior. That we group people as less than. Harmful stereotypes. Let me tell you, I have a kid with Down syndrome. 
a young adult with Down syndrome, I should say. He's a man, he will tell me. And I would get people who would say when he was little, like, oh, well, they're so happy. And I would think when he was real little, and I think, well, he did not stand in the happy line because he is full of it and he's a stinker. Um, and going around being super happy and just like going with the flow all the time was not him. That's an old stereotype or misconception that he could or could not learn, that we were constantly battling. And so educators, I ask you to challenge yourself and share with families what that is. I mean, have you all seen this cartoon? Everyone's seen this cartoon, you know? Could you please shovel the ramp? And we say, um, oh, all these kids are waiting to get up the stairs. So as soon as I'm done with the stairs, I'll get to the ramp. And he says, but if you do the ramp, everybody gets in. And that's so often, isn't that? It's very universally designed, um, targeted universalism. And when we look at what makes, it's common sense. And it can take many forms. Now, I'm going to challenge you all again. People with disabilities, assuming that they want to be fixed, having support and things accessible isn't about fixing them. It's about making their lives possible. Using developmental age and chrono versus a chronological age. I will go down to the mat on that one. Folks will say, well, you know, how does your son function? Like a 20 year old with an intellectual disability. I know, but you know, how does he function? He functions like a 20 year old with an intellectual disability. I don't know there. You could line up 20, 20 year olds who would all be different, have different maturity levels, have different uh, capacities, different strengths. What I can tell you is he loves to golf in playing 18 holes of golf. Super happy to do. Goes out with his grandpa, his uncle, his cousin. Um, loves funny shows and no judging parenting, but he likes if it's action, profane, loud, fast cars. That's his kind of movie. Um, I often say there's no redeeming value, but that he is, that's what he likes. Does he read at uh, any grade level? No. Um, does he answer some of the questions that other 20 year olds would answer? No. Does he like politics? Yep. Does he vote? Yep. What does that look like in our family? We sit down, we use the Disability Rights Oregon Voter Guide. We talk through, we have him watch debates. He thinks debates are a hoot. And he starts, he says, oh, this one or this one. And then he uses his computer to vote. We print his ballot and he sends it in. We don't use, he's 20 years old. So we treat him like a 20 year old and we make the supports and we put those in place where he needs them. And the readiness model, and we would have this addressed a lot. Well, they're not ready yet. And I learned early from my predecessor and dear friend, Roberta, who said, if I waited for my son to be ready to do anything, he would never do anything. If you're always waiting to be ready, I mean, how many of you are always ready to do something that maybe isn't your favorite? But sometimes just being introduced, I can tell you my son is never ready to have to empty the garbage which is one of his responsibilities or clean his room, which is one of his responsibilities. But we've always expected him to do certain things. And if we use that readiness model, how does someone always have to earn their way instead of looking at who is this individual? What are their support needs and how might we make something accessible? And for us, these are ways that we see it happening every day you know, the tragedy or the inspiration, ableist language. And I know many of you have seen all of these things as well. Talking to a, someone like they can't hear you, talking in front of them. We, we get this still sometimes. And so we have to always turn, Dennis, what do you think? Are you talking in front of children? Or do you see edu other educators talking in front of kids like they're not there? 
I challenge you to do that, to not do that, to stop that practice. Because my son's expressive language is difficult. He has other disabilities, but he understands everything. And let me tell you, it impacts. Kids hear you. Even when you think they're not looking, they're not paying attention, they're getting it in their ears. So I'm assuming many of you have heard about this, the medical model of disability. The idea that there's something, the disabled person, that's where the problem is. They can't, they don't, they won't, um, they shouldn't, they couldn't. And this is from uh, a coalition in England. And so we took their graphic. We make the problem the person instead of the social model, which is society. We're not setting up society. We're not setting up the classroom. We're not setting up our materials to support the student. So the problem isn't the person, it's what we've got put around them. We didn't make an accessible format so they couldn't access. So if someone isn't writing at all, but they can type, is it, was it the fact that they couldn't write? Were they the problem? Or was it just how we were asking them to do something? And the disability double standard. I This is something we live with, especially when he was young. He needs to just go right in the trash. We would expect more from people with disabilities than those who don't. Think about um, when they're little you know, the things that kids have to do, that readiness, model, all these things. And then if you look around and you're looking at all the other kids the same age, you're thinking, wait a minute, it's not that much different. So I think it's, it's important to know that because when we hold that double standard, we start to limit access to what could be accessible to a student. And let's face it, we all need support, right? How many of you listen to audiobooks maybe while you're driving? Uh-huh, I saw that, Joy. Or do you use voice to text? Do you send yourself reminders voice to text? Uh, I see some yeses. Um, who uses a calendar? Or like five? Like who has a work calendar, personal calendar, family calendar, right? Um, calculator? I used to have a meme that I can't, I couldn't find. Um, and I got it several years ago and again, dating myself. And it said, um, you know, it showed a, like a, a smartphone and it said, and remember your eighth grade teacher said, you won't always have a calculator, right? You now I carry one all the time. So we all need support. We all need ways to help us remember, to help us be somewhere on time. And that's about accessibility is when we, Quit thinking of it super special and just that it's accessible, we can create those possibilities. And assistive technology specifically, if you look at it, look how it can change our language. We often talk about the power of language. So when you say someone can't read, you're assuming that they don't understand or can't receive the information. But if they like being read to, or they listen to a book. That was always one if my son wasn't reading print. Um, he was in seventh grade and they were doing, now I have to say this, if you're all still reading My Side of the Mountain um, or The Other Side of the Mountain, I think it's called, I read that when I was a kid and that was a long time ago. So one, I would say that, you know, you need to update your curriculum. But they were doing that in seventh grade and they had cassette tapes. And his case manager was surprised because we had accommodations. So he listened to it, but they said all kids in class, when they were doing it, were listening to the, the story. They weren't just reading it quietly. They were all listening to it. And with a little bit more listening, they were surprised because, oh, he was able to get who's the main character. You know, some, I forget all of the things, but that graphic organizer, some of those W questions, he was able to answer. If you had just given him the book, couldn't do it. He let him listen to it, he could do it. 
You know, they can't write a sentence or a paragraph. And maybe what they need is some sort of graphic organizing just to help them form ideas in the way. And you all know, AT Lab is here. They can't talk. They use a device or spelling or gestures or sign language, but they communicate. They can't use a pencil or pen. And so we want to keep them stuck in a goal when actually if we give them a keyboard and let them type, they're able to access curriculum. I almost put there, they can't write. But I thought, no, can't do that because is it writing? Do you want the physical act of writing or do you want them to create content? What's the objective and how can that be accessible? And they're not ready. And often when we have the right supports, they can be successful and learn. Doesn't mean you, you can't teach them how to do it. It doesn't mean that you, you're, you're still teaching, but we just don't hold them back thinking they can't do it because they haven't shown it that they could do it because they actually haven't learned it yet. So it's about possibilities. And I'm sure in this group, many of you have seen this quote around technology but it makes things possible. And I think that absolutely presume competence. I didn't add least dangerous assumption in today, but their invisible deals, disabilities are a challenge to get supports for kids. They need to try harder. I, I, I don't know where to tell, where does that come from? I'm not even sure. Because again, I think when we think of kids do well when they can, so if they can do it, it's not just that they're, we're making those assumptions and that's what gets in the way instead of asking how, what might work. And so I challenge you to create possibilities. And so I thought this is great. I'm not sure if you all, have you all seen this video? I won't play it if you have. Maybe, maybe not. Okay. So I am going to share this video. Whoops. Oops, oh, I just jumped all over. You know what, it did not link. So I'm gonna stop sharing, pull up the link. And this is how one school how they incorporate technology. All right. And now, Stars Mill High School and the Fayette County Public Schools in Georgia are working to establish 21st century classrooms to integrate technology into curriculum, instruction, and assessment to support the participation and achievement of all students. By integrating accessible instructional materials and accessible technology in the classrooms for all students, students with disabilities benefit from the flexibility and supports provided and often need only limited or no other accommodations. They recognize that print textbooks represent a fixed medium, one size fits all, which is not accessible to many students with disabilities. To meet the needs of all students, content is provided in flexible digital media, which is available via technology and can be adjusted as needed. To ensure the provision of accessible materials, Georgia law requires that publishers of recommended learning resources or textbooks provide an electronic version of each student edition. Audrey Tony, the principal of Stars Mill High School, like other principals, sets the tone for the staff and student body. She describes how they work to make sure that accessibility for students with print disabilities is considered in the textbook procurement process. Every time we have a adoption in place, the teachers that are on the committees, the coordinators and so forth that are on the committees, they're gonna always look to see what else does that company bring before we make that adoption. If the company, of course, at this point, only have a hard copy, chances are we're not going to adopt that series. Our exceptional children, 
services are always part of those adoption processes. So they are able to also tell the teachers and the companies of their needs as well. There are two key elements of accessibility that must be in place, accessible content and accessible technology. The assistive technology specialist describes some of the technology included in the 21st century classroom. So each classroom has a projector, it has a smart board or a screen. There is a way for the teachers to save their lessons through Edmodo, which is an online sharing. We have portable tablets that also have software that records. So anything the teacher projects can be recorded and then uploaded for students review later. In the Fayette County 21st Century Classroom Initiative, all students have access to the same complement of software applications on the district computers. Educators and students also use an online network to collaborate on homework, projects, and resources that is accessible 24-7. It has been very helpful because for those students who misplace papers, for those students who need extra support, those documents are always available. Nothing gets lost anymore. It has to be deliberately deleted. So, you know, the dog ate my homework excuse doesn't exist anymore because their documents are, are always available. And we encourage students to share the documents with their instructors immediately so you can see the progress. The, the teachers can comment, help the students progress through their projects. Assistive technology programs that students with disabilities might need are also installed with the suite of software used across the county. So throughout the county, we have some of those items like Free Natural Reader. It's not special technology. It has become instructional, assistive because it may be a requirement for a student, but it truly is instructional technology that any student struggling can access. By making a comprehensive suite of learning technologies available to everyone, the district removed a key barrier to learning, the stigma associated with students with disabilities using different technology than their peers. All the students have access to it, they're all willing to use it, so then our students who really do require it are more willing to use it. Fayette County Public Schools has a Bring Your Own Technology, or BYOT, initiative. Students are allowed to bring and use their own devices in the classroom. Digital content and resources available through the school network can be accessed by a variety of devices. And the closer we stay to a standard solution, the more readily accepted it is, the more easily it is for the student to find that support regardless of what computer they sit down to. And what technology tool, it could be their personal technology, like a smartphone, it could be a tablet, it could be the classroom computer. By setting up adaptable classrooms with a foundation of accessible technology and flexible digital content, the needs and preferences of most students are met. Students with disabilities often do not need additional accommodations or modifications. However, if needed, they are easily included. So, I am going to end there. I would just share that for families, we share, review the IEP. If you think that your student needs AIM, ask. Talk to your Talk to your team, request a meeting, think about what works and doesn't work and share. Um, also that you can that you can look at, and I would encourage you all, is how a student can get access. So thank you. I know I'm right at time. And happy to answer any questions. What, qu what questions do you have for Christy? It's great information and really helping us to look at things from the parent perspective. As you said, we as educators see things and, and, and take for granted that everybody's on the same page. But until we stop and do a check, uh, we've got to make sure um, that we're not just talking, talking gibberish with all of our acronyms. Absolutely. How are families connected with Fact Oregon? 
all over. We have schools who refer them to us, doctors, um, therapists, other families refer. So refer the in the slides that you have in the handouts, the back page has our phone numbers, email addresses where families can get connected. Um, they come in from all over the state. And in support of all different disability categories, correct? Oh, yeah. Cross disability, um, cross age. Yeah, all over. So we support families. We have bilingual staff. So we support directly in Spanish. Other languages, we get support. Um, and the family can just contact. I'll just tell you, they should go to the email address um, that we have on the slide, which is on the back page of the handout. Um, if they contact me, it'll take a little while for me to get back to them, but our support team is there waiting. We have folks all year round um, and they just call us and they will talk to a peer who has walked the walk, who is a parent and helps them navigate. So I don't have any of those numbers, but I mean, we, a family will come to us and we'll work with them through a whole problem and it might take 10 or 12 times of talking um, for us to help resolve an issue. So they just connect. Thank so, you. So we are partnering with you for greater thank awareness and forward movement. Christy, absolutely. thank you so much. Thank you.